again, welcome everybody. Uh, this is a look at Project 25 Digital Radio. And if you were here a little bit uh, earlier, I was uh, speaking about the fact that this is mainly going to be focused on North American public safety uh, radio communications. There's not a lot of use of Project 25, as far as I'm aware, outside of, of North America. I think there may be some in, in Australia, but beyond that, we're looking at something that's primarily in use in the United States and Canada. So moving on to my, hopefully, there we go, perfect. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction to, to Project 25 and how it came to be. And then I wasn't sure about uh, sort of the general knowledge of the collective audience on trunked radio. Now, you guys are, are, are probably all fairly familiar with it. So I'll just give a brief introduction for those who are not familiar with this, this concept of trunked radio, which is sort of key to, to public safety communications these days and, and Project 25. Then we'll take a nice deep dive into the aspects of the protocol. Um, we'll look at, at bits and, and framing and so on, the, the good stuff. And then I've got some demos where I have written some GNU radio flow graphs. I've integrated some other open source software into this really Byzantine set of utilities that I have used uh, to do monitoring and experiments in the past. So fingers crossed that they will all work. I tested them out this morning. They seem to be working just fine, um, but you never know. So about me, uh, I have been working at National Instruments for 21 years. And let me preface this by saying that I'm not speaking for them in this presentation. This is uh, you know, my opinions and all the other caveats that go along with that. Uh, primarily for the first 19 and a half years working on data acquisition. Uh, devices, sort of low-level driver architectures communicating with the hardware. Um, and then in August 2019, I joined the SDR team when I heard about a vacancy uh, to work on UHD 4.0, which is the driver for Edis Research uh, USRP devices. And Edis is a, a owned by National Instruments and the RF NOC, the RF network on a chip uh, architecture, which was great for me because I've been a long time SDR enthusiast going all the way back to 2003. I wonder how many in the audience remember the 10 Tech RX 320D, which is a little box um, that has a serial port on it and a an eighth inch jack. And the idea was it was a headless shortwave receiver. You'd connect it up to a, a control software on your PC, send it commands over the serial port. And what came out of that uh, little jack was, I think, uh, 12 kilohertz worth of uh, IQ data, because you could sample that at, at 48 kilohertz. Um, and so it was sort of very early uh, consumer affordable uh, SDR equipment, and I played with that and decoded uh, digital radio mondial. Um, a lot of fun at the time. And then from there, I've used the Fun Cube, uh, the Air Spy, various all sorts of different RTL SDR dongles, and now of course uh, the USRPs because I actually have an excuse to play with them as part of my job. It's it's awesome, and I have a long time interest in public safety communications monitoring. The summer of my I think 14th year, I got my first scanner, which was a realistic pro 2013 to listen to my hometown police fire and ambulance and then was sort of hooked from there. And I've had various different scanners over the years. Uh, these days, I mainly drive a, I have an old uh, um, BC 796D unit in, which is sitting here uh, beside my, my workstation so I can listen uh, during the day. And then I ha also have one uh, on my end table uh, in the bedroom, an SDS 200 um, for, you know, when I'm, I'm listening before bed. So that's a little bit about me, sort of burnish my, uh, my credentials there. Okay, so Project 25 begins with an assertion I think that will resonate with a lot of the audience, which is that in an emergency, the ability to communicate is often the difference between life and death. I think the, the ham radio community knows and embraces this. And when you think about a disaster scenario, in especially in the United States, 
there are a tremendous number of agencies that need to collaborate and be able to effectively communicate uh, in order to save lives, in order to um, uh, uh, neutralize threats, in order to keep the public informed. From first responders, uh, which work across the city, county, and state levels, to federal agencies, uh, and even to non-governmental agencies like relief agencies, um, uh, local media, for instance. The challenge, though, is that between all of these different agencies across different governmental boundaries, um, there's historically been a lack of interoperability between them. The technical side of that issue is the things that we're good at handling. You know, they use different spectra. That's that's easy. You know, just tune to the same frequency. There are different system features. These are the things that I think we as as technologists uh, are are pretty good at addressing. And then there's the things that it seems like nobody is good at addressing, which is the political side of things, where you have potentially lack of planning on one agency's part that prevents them from being able to effectively communicate. Um, perhaps they don't have the funding to upgrade radio systems. They, uh, there are jurisdictional issues that prevent them from being able to communicate with other agencies and so on. So in short, that in order to have effective emergency communications, you need to overcome these challenges. And that's what Project 25 sort of set out to, to address in the large. So in 1988, uh, US Congress directed the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission, to uh, study recommendations for improving these issues with public safety communication systems. And then the next year, the APCO Project 25 Coalition was formed, and APCO stands for the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials. So they, in conjunction with uh, another uh, other sets of governmental agencies, got together, formed this coalition to draft a set of standards about uh, how public safety communication systems can and should interoperate. And so what came out of uh, these discussions was a set of standards for land mobile radio systems that enable public safety responders to be able to effectively communicate with each other and uh, achieve all of these enhanced outcomes that we would expect uh, once agencies are able to uh, uh, communicate and overcome some of these challenges that we talked about earlier. It means timely response, efficient and effective use of communications equipment. And all of these standards uh, are codified uh, in a series of documents uh, from TIA, uh, TIA 102. These are not cheap documents. I believe they are on the order of, of $100 a piece, and there are quite a few of them. Now, fortunately, you can do some Google searches and, and find them, and there's a lot of information out there. Um, but these this very large set of documents that defines a set of open interfaces between components of land mobile radio systems so that they are explicitly able to interoperate with each other. Okay, so these are the uh, different standards that came out of Project 25, but the one that we're gonna focus on for the purposes of this communication is the common air interface, which specifies the type and the content of signals transmitted by compliant radios. So radios that are able to interoperate with other P25 radios must be able to transmit uh, these packets and use these uh, physical layer and link layer capabilities and so on. Um, the rest of, I'm not, I, I will say, I'm not very familiar at all with the rest of these documents. Most of the uh, experiments that I've done have focused heavily on decoding packets uh, per the common air interface standards. Okay, and now a brief introduction to trunked radio. And again, I, I really apologize if I am uh, insulting the intelligence of the collected audience here, but I didn't want to assume that everybody knew uh, sort of the basics of trunked radio. So I have a little bit of background information about what that is. So, however, I am pretty sure that most of this audience is likely familiar with the concept of a repeater. So content that is transmitted on one input frequency is repeated on a different output frequency. Um, and so everybody uh, can listen to what the transmitter uh, is, is saying. 
But this isn't scalable to a large number of users who want to transmit at the same time for obvious reasons. You have one input frequency, um, there's contention for that. Um, and so uh, how do you overcome something like that? So let's imagine a hypothetical city. Uh, often, at least in, in the United States, cities are broken up uh, for the purposes of public safety into a number of sectors or patrols or divisions. The terminology differs between uh, different cities and agencies, uh, each with units that patrol that particular area. So in this example, we've got an Alpha sector, a Bravo sector, a Charlie sector, and a Delta sector. Um, so if you extend that repeater use case that I just mentioned to the scenario, let's imagine that a Bravo sector unit wanted to communicate with dispatch, so he'd key up transmit on the input frequency, and his communications will be broadcast on the output frequency. Pretty straightforward. But if there's only one repeater uh, of frequency for the entire police department, now all the other units in all other sectors would hear this communication. And that might be fine for a, a smallish city like the one that I grew up in, but for a large city, it's um, you know, that's just not possible. You have many different units wanting to communicate with each other or dispatch at the same time. So the one input frequency, one output frequency just it isn't going to cut it. So one way that you could potentially mitigate this uh, issue of having every unit hear every other unit is to have a subaudible tone that is transmitted uh, with the uh, voice traffic. So that maybe uh, you know, for some particular CTCSS frequency, uh, that opens the squelches of just the Bravo sector radios, and and then they can communicate. But again, this this still isn't scalable for the same reasons. There's only one input frequency. You can't have two units transmitting uh, on the same input frequency without having them walk over each other. So once you add in other agencies like fire departments and emergency medical services. It's, it's just, it doesn't work. So what can you do? Well, add more repeaters on different frequencies and you can assign different frequencies to different agencies. But again, this, this isn't the best use of scarce resources because not all agencies are going to be using their designated frequencies at the same time. And therefore that spectrum effectively is being wasted. Um, and in a major metropolitan area, like where I live, Austin, Texas, the number of agencies times the number of special needs channels typically is, is a very large number. And you just can't have one frequency for each of these combinations. There just isn't enough spectrum. So trunked radio seeks to address these issues by having a pool of frequencies and a computer that smartly arbitrates the use of these pool of frequencies. Uh, in a trunked radio system, one of these frequencies is designated as, as what's known as the control channel. And that carries a digital stream of information that all radios tune to to get their tuning instructions. And that's designated in my little diagram here by the blue transmitter with the uh, binary bitstream underneath it. So let's say that there's a, a Delta Sector Police Department dispatcher. He wants to address all Delta Sector units. So the control channel, in this case, sends out a bitstream with an instruction to all radios registered in the Delta sector that says, tune to this frequency, dispatch has some communication. So all Delta sector radios receive this message, they tune to that particular frequency, they open their squelches and they can hear the communications uh, from dispatch. So with the control channel now indicating to which radios what frequency to use for a particular communication, these spectrum resources can be used much more efficiently. And in this example, one frequency maybe has mobile data terminal data. Another frequency might be in use for a, a fire ground operation. Another unit, uh, so another frequency, pardon me, is it might be in use for Delta dispatch. So trunked radio also kind of enhances communication by adding a number of different features, such as providing status indications. A unit can key up in an emergency uh, with an emergency indication and the dispatcher can handle that uh, appropriately. It can give priority to that communication, for instance. Uh, there's a lot more that trunked radio systems can do. They can patch different talk groups, which essentially represents a, a collection of users together to doing telephone interconnects, to facilitating area and even statewide communications. So very sophisticated uh, uh, systems that enhance communications. And that's, that's really it for my introduction to trunked radio. Um, I hope that kind of clarifies where we're, where we're going from here. Okay, 
The system that I monitor most regularly, because that's where I live, is the Greater Austin Travis County Regional Radio System. It is a Project 25 Phase 1 system that has 66 individual sites covering 40 counties throughout Central Texas. So there's a large number of frequency resources. All of these systems are sort of tied together. There are probably well over, I would say, 500 different individual talk groups. And you can go, um, um, if for those who are not familiar, there's a, a great resource online known as Radio Reference. And it's uh, what I consider to be the premier place to go to look up details of public safety communication systems actually worldwide. It's a crowdsourced database that lists the various sites and the frequencies uh, assigned to each of these sites, as well as which ones are the control channels. So in this slide, um, the one that I monitor most frequently is uh, the simulcast one here. And the red 851.2875 indicates that that's the primary control channel for this system that has, I think this is a total of uh, 20 frequencies here assigned to the simulcast tower. Um, and it lists all this information along with the top groups, which is the, the various users of the system, the ID that that top group is assigned, uh, as well as the communications mode. D indicates digital communications uh, per project 25, and the E indicates uh, encrypted communications. Uh, of which, fortunately, on the uh, Travis County system, there isn't that much. Uh, I can't really say the same for other agencies in some of the uh, adjoining uh, counties to Travis County, which is nice because uh, there's a lot of a lot of good, interesting communications uh, to be had. All right, so moving on from there, let's talk about the P25 CAI. This, as I mentioned before, is uh, the standard that is specific for digital voice modulation and the digital signals that are transmitted and received by compliant radios. It talks about the access method, the modulation type, data rate, and message format for P25 compliant radios. And it is codified in these wonderfully named documents that have just a sort of a string of four letters after TIA 102. Um, so we'll talk mainly here about the physical layer, the media access control sublayer, and then the data link layer. And it is an OSI compliant seven layer model. So above the data link layer, you can have um, different applications kind of built on top of these P25 uh, communications protocols. So at the physical layer for phase one of project 25, modulation is uh, pi over four differential QPSK, quadrature phase shift keying. Uh, there are 4,800 symbols uh, per second, um, but each symbol comprises two bits, which uh, is known in the, in the literature and what I will refer to as die bits. Uh, so you get a total baud rate of 9,600 bits per second. And the way that these bits are transmitted in phase one um, is, so it is a, a four level FSK, meaning that, uh, 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 one deviation, I think of, you know, 3.6 kilohertz uh, is symbol, plus, uh, sorry, 1.8 kilohertz. That symbol is known as plus three, but carries the two bits zero and one. So value one. Uh, at deviation plus 0.6 kilohertz, uh, the symbol is known as plus one, and that transmits effectively a zero. And in, in the same way, you get bits two, and bits three at these different deviations. Now, phase one defines two different types of, of modulation that can be used on the system. The first is known as continuous four level FM, shown there on the left, with a constant amplitude carrier. Uh, and you can see that looking at the um, uh, constellation diagram here on the left, where each of these points is on the unit circle. And that indicates that, yeah, there's a constant uh, uh, amplitude being transmitted there. There's also compatible continuous PSK, depending on what documents you look at, with a variable amplitude carrier. And its IA diagram, diagram looks like this. Uh, uh, and this is its constellation. And you can tell here that the 
the amplitudes are different because all of these points in each of the constellations don't have the same uh, radius from the center. This is also known as linear simulcast modulation. Um, both are used in phase one systems. The CQPSK modulation is more resistant to intersymbol interference and is easier to transmit in a, a so-called simulcast configuration. So here in Austin, uh, we have a simulcast system. There are two simulcast towers that broadcast, um, they, they simulcast their data. So they're transmitting the same information. Uh, and then, you know, you get into the black magic of RF and, and power amplifier electronics. And apparently CQPSK requires linear amplifiers. And so you need appropriately equipped base stations uh, at repeaters and trunk sites. So it tends typically only to be used in these simulcast systems. The portables on the other hand, uh, mobiles transmit C4FM regardless of the type of modulation that they're receiving. There is also a phase two physical layer, which I have very, very little experience with. I've never monitored, monitored this personally, but it, uh, it increases the amount of trans, uh, of data on the system by using a two slot uh, time domain uh, multiple access. So basically breaking down uh, time into multiple slots, two slots um, in a 12.5 kilohertz channel. So each slot is 30 milliseconds. And within each slot, the uh, base stations use DQPSK mod uh, modulation, which essentially is the same as what you saw before, different filtering set. So I'm not going to go into this because I don't really know anything about it. But be aware that there is phase two. Um, and there are some systems that do use phase two. Most of the modern um, Uniden trunking scanners are able to decode phase two transmissions. But I, something I haven't personally listened to. OK. Also at the physical layer, um, the frame sync is a 24 die bit uh, array of symbols that looks like this on the right here, uh, which I've written out and you'll see a, a demo later, um, you know, where I have some, some code that spits out these die bits. And this is the sequence that makes up the frame sync. Uh, as far as how data is transmitted, the die bits across these data blocks are spread um, in order to decrease, um, uh, to, to, to be more resilient to, to burst errors, right? So um, you know you get some noise, and that noise will actually get spread throughout the data block uh, because the portions of the block are interleaved. And then you know what you hope is that the uh, you've got enough uh, error correcting information in the trellis encoding uh, and enough error detection information in in the various types of error detection and correction that are used, which we'll go into, uh, in order to correct those errors. There's a trellis encoding that's used. Uh, there's both a rate one over two code, uh, which is used for unconfirmed data blocks, including these trunked signaling blocks, which we'll talk about later, uh, and a rate three over four code, which is used for confirmed data blocks uh, for data transfers. And all of this is, is well described. If you want you know, more nitty gritty, you can go and download uh, the CAI specs, which you can find pretty easily online. All right, at the media access layer, uh, voice and data messages, sort of the individual units of, of data communication in, in P25 radio are sent over the air as these packets, uh, which break down into two basic uh, types of packets. You have voice related data units and data related data units. And the voice related data units are um, header data units and terminator data units. They sort of bookend voice communication. And then the actual um, digital voice information is carried within logical link data units, uh, which alternates. So you get a LDU1 packet followed by LDU2, LDU1, LDU2 until the end of the voice communication. And then you have one of these terminator data units. There are data 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 related data units as well, packet data units, which carry variable length data. Uh, and then not part of the CAI because Project 25 doesn't dictate uh, conventional or trunked uh, radio system use. It's intended to be used on both kinds of systems. So um, the way that Project 25 kind of interfaces with trunked radio is defining a set of data units 
that specifically um, for use on control channels, but it is not part of the CAI. It is specified uh, outside of that. But because trunked radio is is so critical uh, and in wide use for for public safety communications, um, I'll talk about that in this presentation. And like I said in the previous slide, there's a heavy use of error correction to detection codes that go well beyond my very, very basic linear algebra knowledge, including Golay coding, Hamming, Reed Solomon CRC, BCH coding, runs the gamut. You essentially need a, a PhD to really understand how a lot of this stuff uh, works. But suffice it to say that extra data is sent along within the data units with the goal of being able to detect and correct bit errors in the communication to make it more resilient to issues like interference uh, or fading. OK, the format of a data unit looks like this. It begins with the frame sync that I mentioned before and begins with uh, a network identification code that is sent, which you can think of as a, a code that uniquely identifies uh, the system, you know, almost kind of like a you know, CTCSS code. Um, an access code, and then the DUID, which indicates what kind of data unit is about to follow. Within these transmissions, every so many bits uh, are status symbols that get interjected periodically to indicate the status of the channel. And the value there is it allows radios to monitor incoming data, um, but also provide some out of band data about the status of inbound or, or outbound channels so that the radio doesn't need to tune away to another channel to figure out whether uh, the user is, is able to transmit because the inbound channel is free, for instance. So it's nice um, uh, out of band data that uh, allows the radio to very quickly know uh, and be able to indicate to the user whether or not uh, he is able to transmit at any given time without having to tune away. And then, as I'm sure many of you, especially in uh, in the United States and probably overseas too, because they use it quite a bit there, um, there is the ability to send encrypted payloads. So in the header part of, of the packets, there's a single bit that indicates whether this is a protected packet. And if it is, the rest of it is essentially probably outside of certain highly funded three-level federal agencies is essentially unmonitorable because they use you know, sort of state of the art uh, encryption that we just simply uh, as mere mortals don't have uh, enough technology to be able to, to decode. That is the unfortunate reality of a lot of uh, public safety monitoring these days. There are a lot of agencies that have gone completely encrypted. Um, fortunately, like I was saying, that hasn't happened here in Austin. They tend to encrypt much more um, selectively. So certain channels, Yes, I can understand the need for encryption, but standard dispatch channels or fire ground channels remain unencrypted and monitorable, at least uh, for the, the foreseeable future. OK, so now we're going to take a look at the uh, sort of the format of these different types of P25 uh, data units. So as I mentioned before, or well, I haven't mentioned yet, I guess, but voice traffic uh, is digitally encoded in these LDU1 and LDU2 packets in improved multiband excitation format. Uh, this is a codec that takes uh, human speech and is able to compress every 20 milliseconds of speech into 88 bits of information. So it's a, an effective use of uh, a small amount of spectrum and is uh, was specifically designed to make speech as intelligible as possible. This leads to a, a continuous average of about 4.4 kilobits per second um, that ends up uh, uh, forming the audio data. And the logical link data units have uh, each nine frames. I think I covered that on my next slide. If I'm not missing, yeah, let me pull that down. Yeah, that's better. OK. Um, each of the LDUs has nine frames. Uh, each of which is 20 milliseconds to uh, an LDU1 and an LDU2 frame, which always uh, follows follow each other, uh, comprise about 360 milliseconds of audio data. And within that, uh, of course, is some more out-of-band data, uh, link control data, 
uh, and low speed data that get embedded within LDU. So not only is voice data transmitted, but there's also some um, slower out of band data, which we'll see in a little bit. So voice traffic begins with an HDU indicating, um, you know, if, if this traffic is encrypted, what kind of encryption is being used, uh, then LDU1 and LDU pairs until the end, and then a TDU uh, terminating the voice transmission, or a TDU LC, which is a, tr a terminating data unit with link control, which has additional link control information uh, at the end. And we'll talk about that in a, in a bit as well. Within each of these IMBE frames uh, is uh, quantized pitch information, uh, information about voicing, uh, frame gain, and then various, the rest of it is gain vectors and DCT coefficients. And again, this is very complicated math that uh, uh, is used to encode digital audio in this format, but also to decode it. The thing to note here is IMBE is patented technology of, of DVSI. Um, that makes sort of the, the open source side of things uh, a, a little bit weird. There are uh, open source IMBE decoders, but you know, this stuff is still under patent, so you know, beware, of, beware of all of that. It's, it's described in, in the documentation. Uh, but it, just keep in mind that it is patented technology. So, you know, if I wanted to create my own little super scanner that could do P25 traffic uh, and release it and make money off of it, you know, there, there are patents and would need to be licensed and so on. But for experimentation purposes, you know, I'm, I tend not to worry too much about it. I'm just, just telling you guys. Uh, okay, so I mentioned that link control information is embedded within voice messages or in the termination with link control packets. Um, and that's important because it provides identification information and control information for notifying listeners on a voice call of system events and status. Again, making the radio simpler in that they don't have to tune away uh, and listen to another channel to get uh, important information. This is used both in conventional and trunk systems. And these messages, again, are, are in another document. And that, uh, that data is transmitted in these nine byte packets. Um, and what you'll see in a lot of uh, P25 traffic is that um, there's provisions made for both standard, um, standard P25 messages that every system must be able to respond to. And then there are manufacturer specific extensions uh, that can be added on. So some packets uh, have a flag that indicate whether or not, uh, in, in this case, this is a link control packet, whether or not there's an explicit manufacturer ID. And if there is, that means that this link control packet uh, and the way that it works is manufacturing specific, whereas uh, other packets uh, are P25 standard, which the expectation is, every P25 compliant system will know how to handle that type of packet. And so that allows manufacturers to kind of add their own uh, value to P25 systems uh, while remaining uh, compliant with the protocol. And where here's an example uh, of link control information, which is actually pretty extremely important to the operation of one of my experiments, which I'll, I'll describe later. This particular message is called the group voice channel user message. And it indicates who is using this channel for group voice traffic currently. Um, and this is what the packet looks like. It contains a group address, which indicates uh, which group is being addressed by the user. So this might have something like uh, decimal 990, which is one of the Austin Police Department talk groups. The source address indicates who's using the channel. It's the 24-bit ID of, uh, of the individual user. And then there are some service options here which indicate um, the nature of this traffic. So I mentioned before that one of the things that uh, a trunk system provides is the ability to indicate emergency traffic and to give it priority over the system. Um, that is indicated in the service options uh, uh, byte here in, in bit seven. And there are a number of these different link control uh, messages that indicate everything from system status to um, a telephone interconnects and so on. Again, if you're interested in seeing what all different link control packets are available, that information is, is findable online. 
Okay, now I'll talk a little bit about data traffic. Um, this I don't monitor uh, because I don't see really much of this on on the system that I monitor. Every now and then uh, I'll see PDUs being sent, but I really haven't spent the time to dig into them and 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 look at the data. If I am not mistaken, um, things like mobile data terminals, since the early 2000s, there have been federal mandates to ensure that all of that data is in DES encrypted. And so uh, I don't have any ways to decrypt that. And thus, I don't really have any interest in monitoring it. But that said, I also haven't seen a lot of PDU traffic on the system. So I assume that whatever our agencies are doing for um, uh, mobile data terminal traffic, they're using a different system to do so. And it may, it could be LTE. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I just don't know that, don't have those details. But there is provision within P25 to send data traffic. And that is done through the use of these packet data units. Uh, and data is split into packets that begin with a header and then blocks of 12 or 16 bytes, depending on whether these are confirmed or unconfirmed packets. And you can look at those as, as being sort of a, um, a, a level of service where a confirmed packet means that the receiver can request retransmission of individual blocks, uh, and it will send acknowledgments that it was able to receive the data. Um, you can think of that as sort of like TCP traffic for those who are familiar with, with the IP protocol, and unconfirmed where there's no retry, there's just one single CRC that sent over the entire payload. And if it's corrupt, there's no indication from the receiver to retry it. It's much like UDP in that respect. The PDU header is 12 bytes, where the uh, uh, this IO flag in the first byte here indicates whether this is an inbound or an outbound message. There's a logical link ID, which indicates the source or destination of this message. Um, and then in the confirmed header, there's additional sequence number synchronization fields uh, that allow uh, for the receiver to know if data has been received in the right sequence and uh, how much data to expect uh, and in, in which order. The unconfirmed data block header is a lot simpler and where there would be sequence data is just reserved, uh, uh, reserved bytes. In a confirmed packet, uh, each block remember blocks are comprised of, in this case, it'd be 12 bytes, um, has a per block CRC. And then the last block contains a packet-wide CRC. Uh, within unconfirmed packet blocks, there's only one CRC and that, that takes place on the last block. So you can see there's much more error detection information conveyed with the confirmed data blocks as you would expect, uh, because the idea that's meant to be a reliable message transport as opposed to unconfirmed data. So how are confirmed uh, data blocks uh, essentially confirmed by the receiver? Well, the receiver can send an acknowledge response um, that indicates how they were able or not, as the case may be, to receive the data. So it can indicate that uh, either it received all blocks successfully or that there was a packet CRC failure out of logical sequence. Um, you know, there are different reasons for the failure, but note this last one here, um, selective retry for some blocks. This is interesting because you might expect that um, in a long communication, some subset of those blocks would likely be received correctly, and maybe only a couple are, are not received correctly. Um, in which case, you don't want to resend the entire message. That's, again, a, a waste of bandwidth. So the receiver can say, selectively resend these blocks uh, who uh, failed their CRC checks, for instance. And so the receiver can send a packet, which is it's basically a bit field here that says, please resend me the following packets um, of up to 127 blocks uh, so that I can reincorporate them um, into the parts of the message that are correct and, and hopefully come out of that with a, a fully correct message. I believe there are um, uh, utility types on shortwave that also use this uh, selective retry, uh, selective ARQ. Okay, uh, P25 trunking control. So again, as I mentioned before, this is not part of the CAI because P25 transcends the type of system in use. But it does adapt 
trunked radio control channels to be transmitted on P25 compliant systems. And there have been trunked radio systems around years prior to, to P25 being a thing, but you just can't take an old Motorola type two system uh, or an Ericsson trunk system control channel and transmit it as voice data, right? Because you know you take digital data and you put it through that voice codec and it's, it's just gonna get mangled. There'd be no way that you could decode it at the end. So uh, the P25 standards committee came up with a standard for allow, allowing trunk radio control channels to be transmitted as P25 compliant data on a compliant system. And much like uh, the rest of the P25 protocol supports uh, system independent and manufacturer specific messages. So Motorola can tailor uh, uh, their trunk radio systems to be used on P25. So could Ericsson and, and various other manufacturers um, whom, whom I've lost track of uh, to be able to use their systems uh, in a P25 format. And what's different about uh, the trunking control channels on P25 is that transmissions are broken up into these micro slots of 7.5 milliseconds each, which I'll illustrate here um, on the right hand side of this slide. Um, this is what uh, the block formats look like for trunking data on a P25 system, and you'll see there's a frame sync, a network ID, and then these TSBKs, which is a trunked signaling block that contains the, the bulk of the, the trunk control system messages, and then your status symbols. But then there's also null bytes or null data at the end so that each of these transmissions lines up with a 7.5 millisecond microslot. And the reason for that is to allow a consistent response time for subscriber radios. So they'll know that there is a, uh, a fixed latency for them to be able to access the system. Again, because uh, you know, going back to the, the introduction, timely communications is critical in public safety systems. Um, you know, you want, if you've got emergency communications, uh, you don't want to wait unnecessarily long for potentially these very long trunked messages to, to be transmitted and to give you access to an inbound control channel, you need that communication to take place as efficiently as possible. So they break things up uh, into these micro slots on, on trunking control channels, which as far as I'm aware is not done on regular P25 data transmission. But what's interesting is that uh, these trunked uh, uh, trunked signaling data blocks are essentially unconfirmed packet data units. It's unconfirmed data just specifically for trunk radio communication with these micro slots kind of set up uh, uh, around it. And because trunk system messages um, can be rather lengthy, there's the uh, there's provision for up to three of these trunk signaling blocks to be sent kind of uh, one after another. So you can get messages that effectively, uh, if I'm not mistaken, there are, um, let's see, there are 10 bytes for each of these TSBKs. You can get up to 30 bytes uh, transmitted uh, at a time. So you can have pretty comprehensive messages that way. So it is, as I mentioned before, a multiple block unconfirmed packet format. Uh, there, uh, the standards defined a couple of different types of headers. There's the standard unconfirmed data header, but then there are alternate multi-block trunking headers, and I won't get, get into that. But let's take a quick look at how these would be used in, in trunked systems. So here's an example going back, to our, um, going back to our hypothetical city. And in this example, Delta 201 wants to communicate directly with Delta 205. So in a P25 compliant trunked system, as Delta 201 keyed up, it would send a unit to unit request message with a target ID of Delta 205, source ID of Delta 201, um, and that would get transmitted on the inbound control channel. So the computer would do its thing and it would allocate one of the channels, free channels of the trunk radio system and transmit back a unit to unit grant message. Um, and that would indicate to Delta 205, Delta 201 requests communication and that communication will take place on a particular channel. So one of the frequencies assigned uh, to this trunked radio system. 
Okay. Um, next come the fun part. So I've got some uh, P25 experiments that I'll show off that hopefully will illustrate some of these concepts uh, a little bit more clearly. But first, I have some, some caveats here. Uh, most of this stuff is that I'm about to show is stuff that I worked on three years ago. Um, and since then, I have a toddler and an infant in the household. So my bandwidth for working on non-work or non-parenting related stuff is effectively very small. So when Barry asked me to present, uh, I said yes, kind of with the intent of freshening some of the stuff, but really all I got to do was make sure that it's still compiled um, and worked. Uh, so it, it is very basic and uh, you know I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Also, you'll probably laugh when I show you my GNU radio flow graphs at the signal processing because my knowledge is still uh, very basic. And um, I know that there are probably far better ways to do this that have probably already been implemented. Um, this P25 decoding stuff is, is relatively uh, popular and well supported. Uh, and in future slides, I'll illustrate some other, uh, other tools that, that are available beyond the stuff that, that I used here. So the experiment that I uh, the thing that I really wanted to create a few years ago, uh, I call the scan opticon, a play on pan opticon, because what I really wanted to do, my goal was to record all of the voice traffic on our local trunked radio system to disk with the ability to go back and to listen to it later on. So if something interesting happens while I'm asleep, I can listen to all the traffic the next day and kind of catch up on what happened. Um, long term, what I really wanted to do was make this all web accessible, where I'd have a web page that would show me a graph of all the communication, uh, sort of like a timeline, and I could click on each one, see all the different users who were on the system at the time, and make it really sophisticated and easy to use. So uh, a few years ago, uh, I started to, to work on, on this code, but being an old kind of systems programmer guy, I wondered, well, what's, what's the most Unix-y way that I could go about this. And for those who are not familiar with the Unix way, what that means is uh, Unix has this notion of uh, completing tasks by uh, uh, taking very specific um, utilities together and, and combining them. So you have something that's very small and does one job and does it well, and to kind of connect them via different uh, facilities like inter-process communication. So having uh, one process, pipe its output to another process, pipe its output to another process, um, and then send it along a socket to another machine to handle something. So that's kind of the mindset I had going into to doing this a scan opticon experiment. And this is what the architecture looked like. So this top box here is a process uh, uh, called tower serve, because essentially what it does is it tunes all of the frequencies on a given tower in a trunked radio system, um, and then provides one TCP port, uh, which is the way that you'd get at, at this data, which would essentially spit out die bits. So for each channel in the system, there's a, a it's, well, it's one GNU radio flow graph that kind of splits into different branches. So at the beginning of this flow graph is the IQ data, which can come in from a number of sources. So a USRP, or I had code in there at first for an Osmocom, uh, AirSpy, and then for testing purposes, I could take a wave file of IQ data, which I can record with something like um, SDR Sharp and play it back through uh, for, for debugging and testing purposes. And for each frequency, so I've got 10 megahertz coming in, I do a 32X decimation and a frequency translation, which takes uh, the frequency of interest for that channel and tunes it down to baseband. Uh, so that goes from, what is it, 10 megahertz to uh, you know, whatever 10 megahertz divided by 32 is. Uh, and then I do a 5x decimation F FIR. And then that gets it down to a target rate of 62.5 kilohertz. So it's 10 times the 6.25 kilohertz channel bandwidth. Uh, but those filters are pretty tight, right? So the idea is that um, adjacent channels aren't part of that larger bandwidth. That then goes through an FM demodulator. Uh, so now we've got real valued data coming out of that. There's a uh, raised root cosine filter that is defined by P25 that I use to shape the symbols. 
That then goes into a 4FSK decoder, which looks at the, um, since it's FM data, looks at the amplitude of the, the real-time signal and outputs essentially 0, 1, 2, or 3 uh, to a socket. And it does that for every channel. Now, this is pretty CPU intensive. So in, my, in the bottom here, I have one beefy PC uh, that I dedicate to running tower serve. And when it runs with 20 channels, it takes up about three, three full CPU cores out of the four cores in that system. And then on a less beefy PC, this is where using TCP uh, kind of comes into play because I can now distribute this application. And on a much cheaper, a much simpler PC, I've done this on a Raspberry Pi, in fact, um, I have one process per channel that uses Netcat. This is a standard Unix facility that uh, connects to a port, a TCP port, and outputs whatever it receives from that port um, to the standard output. And then I pipe that standard output into an open source uh, piece of software known as DSD, or Digital Signal Decoder, that I made some modifications to. Um, and then DSD does all the work of taking uh, and deframing those voice P25 voice packets and turning it into WAV files that then get written to disk. Um, and we'll see a demo of that in just a couple of slides here. So I have you know, uh, one process basically, or one pair of processes here communicating over a pipe per channel uh, in the system. And the idea is, as I let this run, every piece of communication, voice communication on the system gets recorded uh, as a WAV file that I can go listen to, uh, time stamped and talk group stamped that I can listen to later on. Okay, a little bit about some of the, the pieces that I talked about. The 4FSK decoder, as far as I know, is not part of GNU, it's, it's not in tree and GNU radio. Um, there is an out of tree module uh, that is available on GitHub, there's the link, um, that uh, I used, but I made some small modifications to it. Normally its output actually is real valued numbers between zero and three. Um, but what I did was instead of outputting, you know, four byte or eight byte doubles, um, I just output a single byte of the number zero, one, two, or three um, based on the slicing decision that's made. And then there's some uh, code in there that actually does some, uh, sends a message through standard GNU radio message queues to do fine frequency adjustments, which if I wanted to, I could pipe that back to my um, frequency translating FIR filter um, to sort of center uh, the channel as the FSK4 module determines uh, the uh, uh, the offset as it moves around, but I, I didn't need it, so I just removed it. I also have a version of that code that outputs packed bytes, so it takes four die bits and outputs it in a single byte for a different experiment, which uh, I, I don't talk about here. So DSD, digital signal decoder, is uh, in fairly wide use from what I've seen. Uh, the code has been out there for many years now. Um, and in fact, there's a DSD plus, I believe, and a uh, the guy is who works on this, I believe, has tried to monetize it, and he's got this fast lane where you can pay to get the most uh, up to date uh, bug fixes and changes, and then those kind of uh, over time filter into the main DSD. Uh, but I actually took this DSD source and made some modifications for specifically for the scan Opticon. So by default. It accepts, DSD accepts discriminator input from your sound card uh, or from a serial port based slicer. Um, and I didn't strip that code out, but I added an additional option to take die bits as input from a file or from standard input, um, which is what I get out of my GNU radio flow graph. Uh, I removed live audio playback function functionality, which means that there's a lot of cross-platform code uh, that doesn't get included. It makes it easier to compile for Windows, for example, um, because all I want to do is write the WAV files to disk. I don't want to play them back real time and listen to 20 simultaneous users at the same time. Um, the other change that I made was to write a separate WAV file per transmission. By default, um, DSD would just write one huge WAV file and keep appending audio data to this one WAV file as it decoded P25 voice packets. Um, but I use this link control information that I talked about before that shows up in the LDU1 and LDU packets to determine the talk group that the transmission is uh, intended for. And that becomes part of the file name that gets written for these per transmission 
uh, WAV files. You should note that there is a DRDSD block, but I haven't played with it. So I could probably replicate most of this stuff completely within GNU Radio uh, if I wanted to. Hi, Aaron. Yes, please. Uh, we've got a couple questions in chat, and I was wondering if yes. you wanted to take those in real time or hold to the end. Um, let me take those in, in real time here. I Let me open up my chat window here. So oh. there are- In uh, chat, two, sorry. <laughs> there are, there are Where, two primary get... questions. Um, yeah. The first one was, uh, does ev every radio has an address? Are all of these addresses unique? Is there some kind of number plan for that? Uh, Yes, every radio address is unique. You can think of it, at, um, I think within a system, that is true. Uh, universally, I am not sure if that is true or not, but the way that I tend to think of it is it is not quite to the level of a MAC address, uh, an Ethernet MAC address, which is universally unique. It's more akin, I think, to an IP address, which is hopefully unique to a, a, you know, a particular network uh, infrastructure. I hope that uh, answers the question. Uh, likely, although okay. Christoph can, uh, can let us know if not. Sure. And then the follow-up question, or the next question was, uh, how close are the frequencies used by the different channels? Uh, is there some kind of planning done so that no P25 channels are next to each other, uh, next to each other are used in the same region? Uh, okay, great question. Um, these are 6.25 kilohertz channels. And from what I have seen in a given, at least in a given uh, uh, radius, adjacent channels are not uh, allocated. That is uh, the FCC, I believe, in the United States is, is responsible for that. And much like um, uh, television transmitters would uh, in a given area, they would not use adjacent channels for the same reason. I believe that's the case here with, with trunked radio systems uh, as well. And, oh, hey, Clayton, GRDSD. Um, good, good to see you there. Uh, sorry, I'm just I'm excited when I see the actual authors of this code that I, I know of and I, I use all the time, kind of geek out that way. Um, so yes, as far as I know, there is planning that is done so that uh, on a given a uh, system or tower in a geographic area, you will not have two adjacent 6.25 kilohertz channels uh, allocated. Great, thank you. Okay. So uh, how am I doing on time? Uh, uh, am I over time or? It, it, as much as we have any sort of definition of overtime, you are over time, but don't let that stop you one little bit. Okay. Um, Keep rolling until until you have to stop. Well, we're, we're, we're near the end here. We're coming to the fun part. We're coming to the demos. Um, so please stick around uh, probably another 10 minutes or so. Uh, and then uh, I'll stick around and, and answer some questions. I, I could tend to be a little uh, verbose. So, um, so, so thanks for uh, putting up with me here. Uh, CCMON, this, the slide that I have up on the screen is uh, something that I've been writing uh, just as uh, as part of not necessarily the scan opticon, but I wanted a way to be able to uh, take to trunked system control channel messages and to be able to decode them for for whatever purpose. Um, actually, it was more of an exercise in making sure that uh, uh, my flow graphs were working and that the TSDU data that I was getting actually made sense. Um, and I have a slide coming up showing a, a long time dream that I have and something like this was kind of, kind of relevant to that research. But what this utility does is it reads control channel die bits uh, from a socket and decodes those TSBK packets into something that is, you know, as human readable as possible. So it indicates uh, currently it's, it's very basic, just this group channel grant information. So when these messages come through that say, um, you know, this group, uh, is communicating on this particular channel of the trunk system. And what is that group? It takes input from the, the radio reference website uh, and decodes the talk group IDs into the actual users, uh, indicates what frequency they're on uh, from the channel ID that is sent as part of the packet um, and whether it's a patch or a, a, just a, a general group uh, message. But I haven't done 
too much work with this. All right, you've you've listened to me for this long, so now you get to uh, enjoy the demo. Um, so this slide here is intended to remind me what I need to do. So the first thing I'm going to do is confirm that you all can see this SSH window I have, um, and, and you should be able to see me typing commands, right? Yes. Perfect. We're good to go. Okay. So this is uh, the quote unquote beefy PC that is running the tower serve process. Um, tower serve is, as I mentioned, new radio uh, code, but it's using the C++ uh, API. Um, and I'll show you what that flow graph looks like. And you'll kind of have to imagine graphically what it looks like in your head, because this is, this is just, uh, like I said, C++ code, but I'm using um, UHD as an input. And this is where uh, uh, this is where the IQ data is acquired. This code here sets up the block for the uh, the UA USRP source. And instead of acquiring 10 megahertz, I acquire three point basically a third of that because that is enough to get uh, all of the channels of this particular tower, and it saves me uh, some CPU usage. So that then, uh, so the IQ data then goes into uh, my first decimator, which does, in this case, it's a 10x decimation, and then the frequency translation uh, to get the channels down to baseband. There's the second decimator, a 5x decimator, um, the quadrature demodulator, the FM demodulator here, um, the RRC filter, which actually comes after the FM demodulator in the, in the graph, um, and then the FFS pardon me, the FSK demodulator, followed by uh, a TCP server sync. So that for each one of these channels, and you'll notice this is in a loop for each channel that is part of the system, um, I get you know, one of these uh, graphs that they all consume the IQ data at the same time. And that just runs endlessly, basically. So um, can you also hear the, the audio, hopefully? You heard the beep. Um, that will become important in a little bit. So I'll run tower serve. And uh, I have a comma separated values file here with all of the frequencies in that uh, the simulcast one tower of the system that I, I monitor on a regular basis. So now this machine on the floor over here is, uh, uh, is running these, these flow graphs. And I can show, if I open up another window here, um, Drag this over. So if I run netcat over to that machine and I look specifically at port 4, uh, 40,016, this is what the uh, this is the data that the flow graph is spitting out. These are essentially sliced die bits, and this is the control channel. So if I stop this, and if I had it close and I could remember what it was, what was the the frame sync was something like one 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 three. 1133 or something. Well, just by looking, I can see that, okay, I can see some frame syncs here. Uh, okay, so uh, that just shows that this is the output of the flow graphs that's running real time. Uh, now I can run the CCMON utility and let's actually try to decode that data and see what, you know, see what kind of traffic is on the system. Um, so here I will admit that uh, the BCH decoder and the trellis decoder here uh, are essentially lifted from another open source uh, piece of software called SDR trunk, which is written in Java, which is close enough to C++ that it was a relatively easy port. But the reason why I ported them instead of writing them on my own was uh, because it was quicker that way. And like I said, my linear algebra knowledge is, um, you know, it's pretty poor. I, I won't lie to you there. Um, and so I incorporated those into this code uh, just to get me up and started really quickly. And it, it tends to work pretty well. So I'll run CCMON and I always have to remind myself of what the uh, arguments are. Um, so I point it to the, the different sites for this multi-site system, the trunked radio system that I monitor. Um, I'll give it a list of talk groups so it knows to decode um, talk group IDs into human readable group names, uh, give it the host, which is my beefy machine, and then port the control channel port. So as I run this, you can see the various 
group, uh, uh, the packets are being decoded. And those that are group channel grants or updates uh, are being decoded and printed with their uh, channel ID and the frequency that that corresponds to, the talk group number, um, and then the, uh, the source, if this is a, a, a group channel grant showing who is communicating, and then the group that is a, a, that talk group is associated with. So I can kind of take a look at this and get a, you know, kind of an overall view of, of what's happening on this tower uh, in the system. So I'll stop that. Okay, so the next thing I will show is this um, script that I have. Uh, sorry, the so we've got talk group, sorry, tower serve is running. It's, uh, I've got 20 TCP sockets that are slicing up the, the channels on this trunk radio tower. And now I'm gonna run uh, the DSD processes that connect, uh, that get the data via Netcat. So if you take a look at um, the script here, I could have done this in a loop, but again, um, this is just for, for simplicity's purposes. So I run netcat uh, dollar sign one, here is the argument, which is the, the host name that I'll give it. And then the port number and use the pipe operator to take that output from netcat and send it into my custom build of DSD uh, with these arguments that uh, you know basically say just decode P25 phase one packets. And the minus W flag is new. And that says append this uh, to each of the wave file names that are being created. And that ensures that um, there should be, even if two, you know, in the unlikely event that two channels are transmitting at the very same time with the same talk group, there'll be unique wave file names. So there won't be any collisions there. And the ampersand means uh, run this in the background. So if I run this, I always forget to give it the argument. Okay, so what you're seeing here is the uh, sort of the output, native output of DSD. I didn't do a lot of work to clean it up. Um, you can see uh, there's a lot of TSDUs because it is it it knows that it's uh, on that one instance of DSD. It's decoding trunked data, but it doesn't do anything with it. Honestly, what I should do is eliminate that channel. But you can also see um, other channels there. Um, and LDU and LDU2 packets flowing by relatively quickly. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, what DSD calls error bars. And that is an indication of um, how the error detection and correction that is within uh, the lib IMBE code, which um, is sort of an open source decoder for IMBE data is, uh, is dealing with uh, correcting any errors that it sees. And the, I don't know exactly what each of those characters indicates, but as far as I can tell, the longer the lines and the more equal signs and R's and M's, the more errors are being detected, uncorrectable errors being detected in the data. Um, and you can see the talk group numbers, that is something that I did add, that's new. Um, so, you know, this is obviously not something that uh, you, you can give grandma who's interested in listening to her local police and have her do on her own. This is very low level stuff, um, but you could see how putting these things together, uh, you could build some pretty sophisticated uh, monitoring systems. So I'm going to stop this. And when these processes stop, uh, DSD indicates uh, some statistics about how it did uh, decoding. And when I do an LS to look at the directory contents, it wrote a bunch of audio files. Um, so if I just, for example, I think 971 is one of the APD. Uh, so that's that's a pretty poor decode right there. Uh, so some of them are better decodes than others. Um, again, it may have to do with my flow graphs not doing good filtering. Uh, it may have to do with the quality of some of the error correction code in, in DSD and in lib IMBE. I'm, I'm not sure which. Um, I am lucky, though, that I live about a mile away from the tower. So I essentially, I get a rock crusher. At, at my SDR, which is great. Um, but still the audio quality leaves a lot to be desired. And I suspect that's, you know, if I had some officially licensed DVSI code to do IMBE decoding, it would be, uh, it'd be a lot better. And I, they actually sell USB dongles that uh, you pass it in essentially um, uh, uh, raw 
IMBE packets and you get uh, audio data out. And that probably has everything correctly implemented. Um, 33 response, I'll take 41st. Receive Medic 30 with Engine 14, stage for screening. I'm Edcom Central. So anyway, that's an example of the output that comes out of DSD. It's, you know, it is fairly audible most of the time, but of course, people's mileage may vary with, depending on the, the quality of the um, uh, the quality of the receiver, uh, their proximity to the transmitter, and, and so on. All the, you know, all the things that affect uh, audio intelligibility um, in in regular amateur radio communications. Okay, and I've got one last slide. One last slide to show you here, or two two slides. So here's some links uh, to some of the libraries that I use. I mentioned Lib MBE. Um, I think this is also by the the same author as, as DSD. Um, and there's some code or there's some comments in there that say this is for educational purposes only again because there's some patent uh, encumbrances. And then IT++ is a C++ library of math and signal processing that uh, I believe LibMBE has a dependency on to do some of the error correction uh, and detection. So these are some prerequisites that you would need to have installed in order to build some of this stuff from scratch. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about a dream that I've had for a long time is uh, to create kind of a do-it-yourself open source trunked radio scanner. Uh, and this has to do with the frustration that I've had with, you know, long-term frustration with the user interfaces for a lot of uh, consumer available trunked radio scanners. It's amazing what what Uniden and um, you know, some of the other manufacturers can do, but I've never found a, a trunked radio scanner that was just super easy to use that met all of the use cases that I cared about. So for instance, when I hear sirens down the street, um, I want to just specifically listen to a given set of talk groups. So I want EMS, I want my local, um, uh, you know, which district, uh, which police uh, sector that I'm in, I want uh, a certain set of things to listen to. And that's really kind of difficult to do on the fly on on some of these uh, consumer available radios. So it'd be nice to be able to kind of define my own user interface for a trunk radio scanner. And I figure I could do that relatively easily by taking something like a Raspberry Pi, an SDR module, um, and putting that in an enclosure with a speaker. Uh, it doesn't necessarily need to have the speaker, but I like to do sort of a, you know, bedside and, and desktop listening and not always have to have headphones on. But there's nothing saying that you couldn't actually broadcast that uh, radio, uh, broadcast the audio to something like a phone, which would be the the interface to control this thing. And it'd be super user friendly. Um, you know, this is just a mock-up of what it might look like. Be Wi-Fi enabled. So programming would be a snap. It would support cloud audio backup, audio streaming, you know, transmit stuff to, um, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the site, but it's the one that uh, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, public safety monitors will use to, uh, is it Broadcastify, I think, to broadcast their audio, just have that all kind of natively built in. And it would have GNU radio support, of course, maybe even implemented in terms of GNU radio. So, you know, if somebody wants to pay me, uh, uh, you know, livable wage so that I could work on this stuff full time, just, you know, contact me. So with that, um, here's a couple of links to additional resources and I'll work with Barry to make sure that, um, these slides get put somewhere where you can access them. And I will work on cleaning up the code and putting them up on, on GitHub or, or somewhere. And uh, really what I ought to be doing is taking some of these enhancements I made to open source, uh, open source GitHub projects and uh, donating things like bug fixes back as PRs um, you know, in the very limited time that I have. I really need to be a better citizen about that. But with that, that is uh, all that I have. And I'm happy to take, thank you for your attention, by the way, I know this is pretty long, um, but I'm, I'm stick around and I'll answer whatever questions you might have for a little while. Thanks again. And thank you, Aaron. Appreciate that and very uh, thorough and educational piece and uh, glad to have you with us. Okay. Christoph, apparently Tetra radios also support a radio to radio mode. Do P25 radios also have this? Yes, th they do. There are specific unit to unit uh, uh, 
uh, messages that are supported on both on, on both trunked and conventional systems. I will I will mention. And I see I'm looking mm -hmm. at some of the other comments here in the chat. There's an out of tree module with support for the DVSI USB modules. That's awesome. What's not awesome is that the P25 DVSI module, the last that I looked, was $500 US. And uh, that's a little bit more than uh, I'm willing to pay for that sort of thing. If that came down to like $100, I'd be all, all over that because I'm sure I'd get better, <laughs> better audio decoding than I do with uh, some of this. But uh, like I said, this works for my purposes and you know I'll continue to use it uh, while I can. Uh, have I ever played with OP25? Um, I'm aware of it, but I don't think I've played with with it very much. I'm not sure what all it uh, it entails. Uh, what uh, modulation by handhelds in phase two? In phase two, I believe the handheld modulation is, and I have it, I noted that on one of my slides here. Uh, it is... Where's that slide? It is called HCPN, Harmonized Continuous Phase Modulation. Um, there's, I can, that is actually described in one of the, actually the freely available um, TIA series documents that I see have been put up online. Um, let me send a link if you're interested in looking that. I believe it's described here in the um okay what is it uh, here's here's the link to the documents for those that are interested this is not uh, a complete set of the documents um but it might be it might be in this one here the two slot tdma overview but if it's not in this one uh there some of the documents that i've linked here do talk specifically about phase two and the the tdma um physical layer. So you might want to take a look at that. OK, I think that's about it for the time being. Uh, Derek, you have any closing comments? I uh, just as a, a kind of a few observations in here. Um, C4FM may sound very familiar to a bunch of ham folks because that's uh, basically the modulation mode, which is used in Yezu system fusion, um, as well as using AMBE, the, the kind of second generation version of the IMBE voice coder. Um, so there's, you can see where a lot of this heritage came from with some of the newer amateur radio digital modes. I, I wonder what other concepts transfer over as well. You know, we, we don't have trunked ham modes, but it would be an interesting concept. I, uh, one of the uh, presentations that I hope we'll get in this meetup later in the year is from the M17 project, which is working to create a, a fully open source, open protocol, digital voice mode for amateur radio using a uh, codec two as the vo voice codec. Um, they're using GNU radio for a bunch of their bring up. So it would be a pretty natural alignment there. Um, and then for C4FM, uh, Aaron, if you do look at, at trying to update your receiver a bit, mm -hmm. there's a PR on GNU Radio right now. It may have been recently closed without merging, but the, there was a contribution where somebody had written a bunch of C4FM uh, demodulator blocks, and those, oh, those were supposed to have good performance. That's uh, that's interesting. I'll, I will have to take a look into that, as well as um, this the the OP25 stuff. I just took a look at the web page, and it looks like there, there's a lot of good stuff in here that uh, I I may be able to look at uh, and leverage for you know so, so for my own purposes. And it's probably a lot better than the stuff that that, that I've written, to be honest. So um, th yeah, this is great. Yeah, OP25, it's uh, it's a very, there's a lot of stuff in there. It's not very easy to use, but it, it has an MB decoder, uh, which is completely different from the one that's in uh, BSD. Um, it does, it decodes the trunking uh, channel, as far as I know. 
Um, and so anyway, like it has a lot of code that might be useful to put into other projects. Yeah, definitely. And I see you're, um, you're a VE3, uh, which is, if I remember correctly, is Ontario because I grew up in St. Catharines, actually. So um, uh, when I think about trunk systems up in that area, I know that the, um, doesn't the uh, Ontario government have a province-wide P25 system for um, like, like Ministry of Health, for instance? Yeah, as far as I know. Um, and the OPP, I think, use that as well. And yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in the Ottawa area, and they and here in the city of Ottawa, they've also recently transitioned to uh, P25, but I, I have not played with it in years. Yeah, I would not be surprised either to, to find that, uh, you know, that a lot of that, uh, especially police activity were were encrypted, because I know it is, and it has been for a good 20 years in, in southern Ontario, most of the stuff is, is not monitorable at, at this point. Um, I don't even know about the, the Toronto Police Services, whether or not they've, um, last I heard they were still in an analog system. But again, like I said, it's been nearly you know, 22 years since I lived in that area. So um, I haven't been keeping up quite as much. Um, Christoph has another question. Why did you write in C++ and not use new radio companion? Uh, that that's a, an excellent question. Uh, C++ is the language that I know best um, and am most familiar with. And recall I got started with this three years ago, and my thinking has changed since then. But uh, I was I was worried about uh, the performance of the Python wrappers uh, around GNU Radio and wondering if um, it, you know, I'd already am maxing out three cores of my, my quote unquote beefy PC, which to be honest, really isn't that beefy. Um, and so what I wanted to do was eke out every ounce of performance that I could. And it, you know, C++ is what I typically think is of as the best way to do that. And besides that's the, um, that's the language I knew best. So I used the, the C++ kind of the low level new radio runtime uh, APIs. Um, and I see GNU Radio can generate C++ code now. Um, yeah, uh, I, I've been using, you know, now that I, I've been working on USRP and, and GNU Radio stuff a lot more. Uh, I have a lot more, uh, a lot more interest in in the the Python wrappers and and that part of it, and uh, you know, even running things within GNU Radio Companion. So. It's, it's really just that's where I got started. And, uh, you know, it was the, the way for me to bootstrap the this, this stuff as quickly as possible when I started working on this back in 2017 or so. I'll jump in and say I, I'd love to see uh, more talks in the future of people using GNU Radio as a code library. Um, because that is, that, that is the origin of the project. And there's definitely still a lot of things that you can only do if you are writing code that just aren't possible within GRC. A lot of the control flow and stuff like that is is much simpler if you handle that in your own in your own code. That's that's right. And uh, you know, one of the things I had been I'd also experimenting with is you know, as I mentioned a number of times, my signal processing knowledge is is not very sophisticated at this point. So I'm wondering if there's a better way to extract a number of narrowband channels from you know, a, a fairly large portion of the spectrum. And what I came up with was, okay, I've got these, you know, these 20 branches off of the tree, but then there's also you know, polyphase filter banks. And I considered looking into that, but, um, but one of the issues that I, came, I, I ran into was the polyphase filter bank uh, you know, if I had 10 megahertz of input and I wanted 6.25 kilohertz channels, that's 1600 outputs. Um, and, you know, needing syncs on all but 20 of those, that was, you know, setting stuff up like that. I guess there's bus bus support now in, in GNU radio would be a little bit difficult. But also I found that uh, I wondered if you could, you didn't have to hook up all of the, the outputs. You could kind of leave some unhooked up if you played with the, uh, what is it, the channel vector or something. But then there's an issue if you have a different number of, 
I ran into an issue, though, where it would have required that I shut off tag propagation. I think that's what it's called. And that wasn't available through the Python API. I was kind of surprised I couldn't. I would have to do it in C++ to get that uh, behavior. So yes, um, to, to Derek's point, there are only some things that, that C++ allows. But I'd like to investigate more of the, the use of the, the PFB and, you know, whether that you know whether that would be more efficient than you know 20 different branches with with two you know essentially two fir filters and a, a you know complex multiply to, to to shift the spectrum yes cool <laughs> but but i uh, there like you were saying there there may be uh missing Pyth missing pieces to the python wrappers uh yeah. we accept both issue and bug <laughs> issues and PRs, <laughs> um, but I, a PFB canonically should fit exactly this sort of application where you have evenly spaced channels. Mm -hmm. um, the issue where PFBs can be difficult is if those channels aren't evenly spaced. And something I don't know is if the GNU Radio polyphase filter bank supports sparse channelization, um, but there's no fundamental problem with the underlying algorithm so right. that might be an extension we need but it would be a good one <laughs> having worked with usrp devices really i'd love to do a lot of this channelization in the fpga and you know the out my the end of my rf knock flow graph ideally would be these very low bit rate um uh, low bit rate die bit streams that I could then just devote the CPU to doing the, the voice decoding. Um, that'd be that'd be really cool. But save that for another day. <laughs>